Good afternoon. Thank you all. I have my work cut out for me. I like a challenge. Uh, I'm intent on reversing the epidemic of obesity, diabetes, and associated chronic diseases in this country. Um, I'm pretty sure you've noticed that about two-thirds of us are overweight or obese. You may be more surprised to learn that about half of us now are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. Pre-diabetic is like being pregnant. The longer it goes on, the more difficult it is to ignore. <laughs> I, another way that I think about this problem is I say that all roads lead to Medicare, by which I mean that if we don't figure out how to fix this problem, we will finance it, and it is economically unsustainable. Um, before I did all of this work, I uh, spent a number of years in environmental engineering consulting, and that's where I learned that it's a lot smarter to prevent trouble than to chase it. Um, I'd like to spend a couple minutes talking about my patient population. Over the last 20 years, I have had the privilege of caring for a great number of smart, motivated, resourceful individuals, people who are used to solving their problems. And yet, on the day I meet them, almost all of them would agree that they have already tried everything they can think of and nothing is working. It does not add up. So I took a look at those, that information. Everybody's trying as hard as they can. Nobody's making any headway. And I thought, there's a fundamental misconception here. Our society believes that obesity is an overindulged state. If that were true, then diets would work. I ate too much, I should eat less, I should be good. But we all know diets don't work at all. The processed food industry has been so successful at promulgating its marketing messages, and we have so thoroughly internalized those messages that when our bodies don't respond as expected, we don't think to ourselves, there's something wrong with that message, or there's something wrong with that product. We think there's something wrong with me, and that's not okay with me. There's a fundamental misconception that obesity is an overindulged state. It is not. Obesity is a malnourished state, and the solution is to improve the nutritional value of the food we eat. And that's actually what I came here to talk about. So I'm going to divide my comments into three categories corresponding to the three macronutrients in our diet, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. I think there's the most confusion about carbs, so I want to start there. In your mind, I want you to divide carbs into two categories, intact carbs and stripped carbs. Intact carbs have an intact fiber matrix, Stripped carbs have had the fiber matrix stripped away. Intact carbs include four categories of food, vegetables, beans, fruit, and whole grains only. The other thing that connects them is color. So most of the color in our diets comes from intact carbohydrates. Each color, I think of each color corresponds to a, photo, to a phytonutrient, and phytonutrients are like building blocks in our bodies that help protect our immune system, that help us heal, because you never know if you're going to scratch a cornea or sprain an ankle or catch a virus that strips your gut. But if you're healthy and you're well, first of all, maybe you won't even catch that virus, but if you do, you should be able to mo mobilize all your resources and heal faster if you're well nourished. So this is about nourishing ourselves. On the other hand, there are stripped carbs. Stripped carbs means cornstarch, white flour, white rice, sugar, corn syrup. There's a reason why a pile of white flour looks like a pile of cornstarch, looks like a pile of confectioner sugar. The essential original identity of that food has been removed. The wheatness is gone. The cornness is gone. And all that's left is a pile of white starch. What happens when we eat that stuff? Our bodies release a boatload of insulin to catch it. 
Insulin is like the escort service that takes the sugar from our blood stream into our cells. If you don't have enough, the sugar just floats around waiting for more to show up. So insulin also happens to be a fat storage hormone. Therefore, we can influence what we weigh by eating in a way that conserves our insulin supply. So the way you're going to do that is as follows. This is how it works. Let's say you got invited to a huge party, massive party. Party starts at 7 p.m. on the nose. At 7 p.m., a thousand cars show up at the party center. They better have a lot of valet stepped or park all those cars, right? Okay. But they could have had an open house. They could have said 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. At the end of the day, still would have parked a thousand cars. But you wouldn't have needed nearly as many valet staff to do it. The sugar is the cars. The insulin is the valet staff. If all of your sugar shows up all at once, because you ate a pile of white flour, then you need a boatload of insulin to catch it and take it to all the cells. But if all your sugar drips in bit by bit by bit, because, I don't know, you ate a bowl of, let's say, no, definitely not. <laughs> so let's say you ate a bowl of refried beans. Then you absorb the sugar bit by bit by bit as you break it down, and you only need a little bit of insulin to catch it. So our goal then is to shift your diet in the direction of foods that you absorb more slowly so that you conserve your insulin. Insulin is like your blood sugar. You don't want it to be high. You need it to live, but more is not better. So we want to modulate our insulin levels just like we want to modulate our blood sugars. By the way, insulin prefers to store fat right here and right here. So even if you're slender, if you see that your fat is collecting here and here, then you know that you're in a high insulin state, even if you're not overweight. All right, so we're going to shift our diets in the direction of three things to protect our insulin levels. Intact carbohydrates, nourishing fats, and high-quality protein. So let's talk about fat. There's been a tremendous amount of confusion through the years. I'm pretty sure that almost everyone in this room grew up the message, if you eat fat, you will get fat. Nothing could be further from the truth. But finally, among my colleagues in the scientific and medical communities, we have some agreement that there is a certain list of fats that pretty much everyone agrees are nourishing. And these are avocados, olives and olive oil, nuts and nut butters, deep sea fish, even a little dark chocolate. These are nourishing fats, and you should feel free to eat them. On the other hand, there's a whole category of fats that I don't want you to eat at all. And these all were invented in the 20th century. They are the fats that make up non-dairy creamers, coffee whiteners, as I like to call them, uh, margarine, um, partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, soybean oil, corn oil, cottonseed oil. Did you know that the original meaning for Crisco was crystallized cottonseed oil? So you tell me, when did cotton enter the food supply? Now, there's a whole category of fats I didn't mention yet. These are primarily fats that come from four-legged animals. Here's the deal. Some of my colleagues think they're a perfectly reasonable part of a healthy diet. A lot of my other colleagues think that they are more like rat poison. I think we're going to know more in the coming decades. Until then, use your common sense. Don't eat them very often. Maybe a couple few times a month, I would say. But when you do eat them, they should come from animals that were the healthiest animals you have access to. Grass-fed, pastured, free-range, it really makes a difference. Now, I know it's expensive. That's, one, that's another reason to not eat it very often. This is a, this is a very expensive, resource-intensive part of the diet. I understand that. This is a good time to switch to protein. So you know this expression, you are what you eat? Well, also, you are what what you eat eats. And whenever you eat something that came from an animal that ate a substandard diet, you're just concentrating the garbage up the food chain into you. If we don't spend our money at the grocery store, 
we're going to spend it at the drugstore. So yes, it's expensive. On the other hand, there is a very inexpensive and significantly underappreciated and underutilized source of high quality protein, and that is beans. I'm not just talking about pinto beans and lima beans and navy beans and uh, kidney beans. I'm talking about hummus and edamame and lentils and peanuts. Do you know peanuts are a bean? I don't know if you knew that or not. That's why they're called peanuts. So, um, so we should be eating a lot more of these foods, a lot more. And <clears throat> it's good for our wallet as well. Beans are magic. Um, we have written stories about magic beans. Many cultures have a story about the magic beans. Uh, we have uh, told silly songs about beans being magic, as I'm sure everyone could sing for me. Uh, so even before we understood the science of beans, and the science, by the way, is that beans are one of the, the magic. What's magic about beans is that they're high not just in fiber, remember they're an intact carb, but also protein. So beans are the only food in the universe that's very high in protein and fiber at the exact same time. So we can leverage that information also to improve our nutrition. Now I have a couple of pictures for you. These are before and after pictures of me before and after uh, my epiphany and when I stopped eating most intact, uh, most, I'm sorry, stripped carbohydrates, white flour and so forth. So this is not a bad picture. This is a picture of me about 13 and a half years ago. And uh, it looks pretty reasonable, except if we look at it like a physician, you'll see that there's some discoloration across the bridge of my nose. If you look above my eyes, underneath my eyebrows, you see there's some swelling there. We call that periorbital edema. I inherited a genetic tendency to have prominent cheekbones, but what you see here is what we call buccal fat pads, which makes me look like a baby. And uh, there's even a little hint of an early double chin, plus a um, kind of a diffuse, sallow, yellowish discoloration and thickening of the skin with enlarged pores. That picture, by the way, was taken in the summertime. This is a picture of me three and a half years later after I stopped eating those things that I was talking about before. And you'll notice all of that is gone. And this picture was taken in the dead of winter. So it's not a matter of suntan. Here you can look at them side by side and get a better sense. One thing I noticed uh, just about a month ago when I was looking at these pictures and preparing for the talk was that the swelling even extends to my gums. So on the left, you can see my gums are a little bit swollen and pink and discolored. And on the right, they've tightened up. The color is much better and so forth. So, so you too can do this. Now, I don't want you to believe a single thing I told you today. As far as you're concerned, I'm just one more medical professional giving you nutritional advice that may or may not make any difference. But if your pants fit better in two weeks, then you can believe it. Tip O'Neill, former Speaker of the House, said all health is personal. I'm sorry, he said all politics is local. I say all health is personal. <laughs> We wouldn't be in so much trouble if he'd said it so. <laughs> so trust your gut and remember that it really is true that all roads lead to Medicare. But this isn't just the most economical way to deliver health care. It's also the most humane. Thank you.